Hi, everyone. My name is Brandon Gracknoth, and I'm a market research analyst here at Hamamatsu. And I'm also the host for today's podcast. With me, I have Gary Spingarn. Hello. He's our resident mid infrared technology and application expert. And today we're going to talk about quantum cascade lasers, also known as QCLs. So, Gary, we know mm -hmm. that most lasers have a gain medium and a pumping mechanism, which results in beam emission. Mm -hmm. Though QCLs Correct. seem to be much more complex, and that's putting it mildly. How are Absolutely. QCLs different from other lasers? So, when you think of a typical diode laser, uh, you have this set of active material that is pumped until you get emission, right? Uh, the wavelength emitted is determined about uh, determined by the material itself. That is not quite the case with the QCL. The wavelength, alternatively, is determined by the design and layering scheme of the semiconductor material. What do I mean by that? Within this laser, there are many, many what we call active regions. And inside these active regions, there are quantum wells that are angstroms thick, layer, layers that are angstroms thick. We're talking extremely small. And a voltage drives electrons across these active regions. Now, uh, a quantum phenomenon known as tunneling happens that's extremely nebulous and abstract. The important takeaway here is that as we're driving electrons across this medium, they are reaching lower energy states and they uh, yield photons. So electrons are cascading through the active regions, uh, achieving the infrared light we want. Hence the term quantum cascade laser. Hmm. So, so how are QCLs used and what applications can we find them in? Oh, a QCL can do all sorts of cool things. Uh, a QCL can lead away a heat sinking missile. Uh, it can characterize critical proteins and production of biomedical treatments or pharmaceuticals. Uh, they can test for extremely trace gases in a semiconductor setting, which is important because these trace gases are contaminants. Uh, they can even be involved in imaging. Uh, new possibilities are being developed every single day. Um, one key application I've heard for QCLs is spectroscopy. Um, Mid-IR spectroscopy has been done with so many different light sources. Uh, for example, we have LEDs and different black body sources that can output at the fingerprint regions in the mid-IR spectrum. How do QCLs change the mid-IR landscape? So great question. Uh, starting with thermal sources, tried and true, uh, very easy to handle, all sorts of market options, uh, and they provide a very broad output, uh, pretty much all the wavelengths you want. However, you're not getting quite a lot of photons or output power, and they aren't very power efficient and can have short lifetimes. Uh, LEDs can be somewhat similar. They, they can provide uh, much more efficiency, but you're not getting the broad output, and they're more suited towards applications like non-dispersive infrared for gas analysis. But again, not a lot of output power. The really big difference here, uh, and this might sound pretty simple, is you're getting a whole lot more output power, uh, plain and simple. So this enables more sensitivity than ever before. Uh, the mid-IR region has long eluded a lot of applications due to technology limitations. Uh, so now with the quantum cascade laser uh, reaching new innovations, there's no telling how much information is lying in wait for us. And so the, to put in a, to give an example, I mentioned NDIR before. So when going after a single gas, all these new photons, uh, this all this new output power, we can achieve sensitivity of parts per trillion, uh, unheard of in decades past. But also, uh, one could use quantum cascade lasers and spectral analysis, like an FTIR. Wait a second, FTIR. How could a QCL fit into a broadband high specificity application like that? So it's important to note that there are different types of quantum cascade lasers. Uh, one is an external cavity laser. Uh, to put it simply, you start with a base chip and then there is a very sophisticated optical system uh, around the broadband gain chips that will achieve certain wavelengths and allow to tune or scan through these wavelengths. And this, uh, with the system, you will be achieving a broad output that is necessary for FTIR. Huh. So, so that scanning function even allows broadband QCL options. Mm -hmm. What other types of QCLs uh, are there? So that's a great question. Uh, so to me, there are kind of uh, three main areas that I look at. There are 
external cavity QCLs. Uh, there are many subtypes, but uh, the, the important uh, fact here is that there is a optical system around the scan chip achieving broadband output. Alternatively, there is the DFB laser, the distributed feedback uh, laser. This uses a grading system that achieves a single frequency, a single wavelength at a very, very, very tight line width. Why do we want this? It is fantastic for gas analysis, namely absorption spectroscopy. This is what enables the extremely high sensitivity gas measurement of parts per trillion and in academic settings, parts per quadrillion. Uh, another less popular option is a Fabry-Perot chip. It's kind of like a base chip level of a laser. Uh, it will, it's usually pulsed, not a very stable output, but if you have a lot of data already characterized in a wavelength window uh, and you're looking for a low cost option, that can certainly be a way to go. I see. So what should we look out for when we compare these different types? Mm -hmm. So there is a huge list of general specifications uh, when it comes to uh, quantum cascade lasers. So what I'm about to talk about isn't comprehensive, but it hits on some important points. Uh, first and foremost, of course, I mentioned it before, output power. Uh, different lasers are gonna have different output powers uh, and you need to know what level of sensitivity you need uh, for the application. Um, and the when it comes to broadband lasers, the output power might differ across its wavelength region. So it's very important to know. Uh, there's also a difference between pulse lasers uh, and CW operation. That could also have big implications on the application as well. Uh, when it comes to a DFB laser, uh, one can still tune the wavelength a little bit, usually by a wave number or two. And this is uh, uh, done with current or temperature tuning. In a DFB laser, current and uh, temperature are tied together. Uh, so the uh, temperature range of the laser is extremely important. Also, as I mentioned before, line width. Uh, the laser is going to achieve a certain line width and tighter the line width, uh, the better. And of course, with all light sources, uh, there's power consumption. Uh, unfortunately, uh, quantum cascade lasers do require a, a fair amount of power. So this is also something very important to consider. So speaking of running these things, if mm -hmm. I were to have one of these things in my hands, how do I get it up and running? So again, not a comprehensive list, but hits on the important po uh, points. You need a, a laser driver and a TEC controller and direct power supplies, and typically uh, some PC software if you're doing the, you know, some spectral analysis, typically. So I think you've offered a, a pretty comprehensive overview of QCL so far, but there's one big question on everyone's mind. Why does this technology cost so much? That's probably the most common question that I run into. Uh, and I'm going to go back to uh, the initial discussion we had at the beginning. So all these active regions with quantum wells, angstroms thick, uh, achieving certain wavelengths is an iterative process and it yields is is very tough uh, this is what what can drive up the cost also an extensive amount of testing needs to be done at these lasers so i list some specifications before that must be rigorously te rigorously tested uh, lifetime testing takes a very long time so there is a lot of cost that goes into that as well in terms of the labor and the apparatus necessary uh, however uh, hamamatsu uh, has recognized that this is a a driving concern in the market. So we've done a couple of things. Now we are offering uh, DFB lasers, traditionally in expensive HHL packages and a new smaller, cheaper butterfly package. And also uh, external cavity lasers, EC lasers have long been very, very expensive, uh, but we now offer a swept QCL that can achieve a two micron window. So if you know what wavelengths you're after, uh, this can be a more cost efficient alternative. Oh, that's awesome. It's, it's good to hear that we don't need to break the bank to get the performance a QCL offers. Absolutely. And more innovations uh, to come for sure. Mm. All in all, I think that uh, you gave a pretty great introduction to QCLs as a whole. I think it's pretty clear from today's chat that when it comes to high performance emission in the mid IR without much compromise, 
the QCL is the right source for the job. Absolutely. So, thank you, Gary. Thank you for your time. And a big thanks to all of you at work and at home for coming out today. Uh, stay tuned for more upcoming detector, light source, and infrared uh, podcasts in the near future. We're just barely scratching the surface of these topics. So I hope you'll all be along for the ride. Be sure to have a great rest of your day. Okay. Thank you all. Thank you.